help me welcome Cheryl Cohen Green to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you already know my name. That's what I started. I was going to start with. But I've been a clinical sexologist and a surrogate partner therapy uh, therapist in sex therapy for 40 years. And my practice is in Berkeley, California. I'm here tonight to talk to you about a community of people who are unfortunately overlooked. I'm a great believer that everybody has an innate desire a sexual desire and potential. And the people that I'm going to be speaking about tonight, because of Mark O'Brien, he was my first profoundly disabled client, are people like you and I, only the challenges are much greater. When I first met Mark O'Brien, it was in 1986. But before I get to Mark, I want to give you an idea of the population of people that I work with. There are many clients um, who have acquired or had a disability from birth, a congenital disability. There are people with multiple sclerosis, well that's an acquired, but genetically it's probably a pre predisposition for it. Muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, spinal bifida, Asperger's syndrome, and people who are m mentally, uh, intellectually challenged. And these are some of the clients that I've worked with over 100 in the last 40 years. Mark was the first profoundly disabled client, meaning that he had been paralyzed, but he didn't have a spinal cord injury. The polio had s just weakened all his muscles so that he, had, he, he could not move except for one finger, and he could use his lips. And he would use his lips and his teeth to type on a word processor. He had a stick that they fashioned for his mouth and a little rubber tip on the end of it that he used to type out each individual letter. When his therapist contacted me and said that there was a man that she would like me to consider working with, she said he was 36 years old, he was a virgin, and that he wanted to explore whatever he was capable of uh, sexually. And she told me that he was in an iron lung. My first thought was, how am I going to get in? You know, what am I going to do? But I was blown away by the idea of him typing and writing poetry. And he was working on the book that was published after his death called How I Became a Human Being. It's an amazing book. So I've, my first interaction with Mark was a phone call. He called me and told me that he felt like he was on the outside of a restaurant in front of a large window, looking through that window and seeing a whole group of people having a feast that he would never get to taste. And I said to him, you deserve a seat at that table. So we met. And believe me, if you've seen the movie, uh, Mark was much more fragile than John Hawks. But he weighed 60 pounds and he was four foot seven. His very delicate arms and hands. And he taught me how to handle his body, and the intention of each time I was with him was to help him learn, and for me too, where I could touch him, where we had responses that were both pleasurable and sexual. And I do that with all my clients, whether they're disabled or not. It's all about communication, relaxation, teaching clients how to pay attention to themselves, not be selfish, be interested in what your partner feels, but how do you communicate with each other? And a lot of us don't get any of that. I mean, are we're our parents telling us about this? Forget it. You know, they have a hard enough time dealing with. I don't know. I, I know my parents didn't. My mother never explained anything to me. It was all hit or miss. Um, so with Mark, he had also gone to. He had not had a chance to go to Catholic school, but he was from a Catholic family, and so am I. Um, so when we met, we, he came from Dorchester, which is a part of Boston. Yay, go Dorchester. I'm actually from Salem, Massachusetts, and you'd think that I wouldn't have this accent, right? I've been here 45 years. But I go back every year to practice. <laughs> but when I met Mark, I was scared. I mean, I walked in, I saw this very fragile man, and the intent, my intention was to help him. My intention with every client, whether they're able-bodied or not, is to go out into the world with a new awareness of how to communicate and how 
to meet somebody in the future and have a more rich and, and delicious relationship. And that's the way I felt about him. Although I have to admit, there was a part of me that was very frightened, okay, I'm gonna be doing all these things with him. What if he never gets the opportunity? And he was in the eye and lung, but in the early years when I first met him, he was able to get around Berkeley on a little gurney. And he could move his, the, the, the motor with his one little finger that moved. And if you've ever seen the um, documentary about his life called Breathing Lessons, if you haven't seen it, it's amazing. It won the Academy Award in 1997 for Best Short Film. Uh, you get a real sense of how amazing Mark was. So we learned what felt good, what didn't. I explored his, his whole body as much as I could. He could not move, so I was very careful to move him to get every part underneath his butt, every part of him. Um, we explored everything. We explored snuggling, kissing. He said to me, you know, you're the first person who I, who's ever touched me for anything but just maintenance, for just pleasure. He had been, you know, kept clean and, and washed and oh, taken out of the iron lung, put on his gurney. But his attendants weren't there to massage and do all the things that um, I wound up doing with him, especially not to have intercourse with him. Um, it was a challenge because of his body, but we did it. And um, in the movie, I actually had an orgasm, and I did. It wasn't faked. Um, and I remember, in the movie, I remember sitting there saying, mm, I didn't, they, I said I loved him. And he said he loved me first, and I said I loved him. But I also said to him, which wasn't filmed, I love you in this very moment for what we just shared with each other. And when you have your future relationship, it's going to be so much more fulfilling. Your partner, so get a photon, he did do that finally, so your partner can stay here with you and wake up with you in the morning and share the morning and breakfast. So we had six sessions, and in those six sessions, we did accomplish a lot of what he wanted, pretty much everything. Eight years after our time together, he did meet Susan Fernbach, and I can mention her name because she's in the movie, and they had the last five, spent the last five years of his life with him, together. Um, he died in 1999 in July, just shy of his 50th birthday. But he taught me a huge amount. He taught me how to deal with my next profoundly disabled client. Before I tell you about him, I want to tell you that many people say to me, Cheryl, how can you work with the disabled the way you do? And I said, well, you know, let me think about it. And it didn't take me more than a couple of seconds, and I thought, it was my mother. My mother was my teacher. My mother and I always didn't have a great relationship, um, and that changed before she died, thank God. My mother and I found each other. But when I started doing surrogate work, she had a fantasy that I was carrying on and something. Get out of the house, she told my brother. She's going to be arrested pretty soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a long time ago. In the 70s, she was saying that to my brother. Run away, get away from her. But in later life, she said, I love you and I'm proud of you. My mother was the person who I watched all the time. I think all kids watch their parents, right? I mean, parents are their role model. You can either be a great role model, like Evelyn's family, or you can have some issues going on, like in my family and so many others. But my mother always had compassion for people, whether they were able-bodied or not. And I remember when I was just a little girl, we had a friend, um, my mother was walking me to the Salem bus terminal. And there was this little boy, he was eight years old, I was 10, so it was 1954, and he was standing there, he was about this tall, he was eight. And he had a very large head, he had one eye up here, one down here, little mouth, strange voice, narrow little shoulders, he limped because one hip was higher than the other. And as we walked towards him, my mother said, good morning, Jimmy, how are you today? And he said, hello, and we kept moving, and I must have been staring at him, and my mother said, don't stare at Jimmy, you might hurt his feelings. And as we walked further on, she said to me, he was born, something was happening with his brain, that's why his head is as large as it is, and his body looks different than ours. He's so much smaller than he should be at his age, and he probably won't live to be an adult. And I remember feeling really sad, but also very curious, like kids are curious, what's going on? So I would go to the bus terminal often after school, and I'd see him there. My mom wasn't always with me. And I'd always say good morning to him. Good morning, Jim. And I'd walk into the bus terminal, and he'd respond back, hi, hello. 
And then one time I went to the bus terminal, he wasn't there. And the next time I went, he wasn't there. And I told my mother, and she said, I'm going to look into that. And she told me she had found out that Jimmy died. And every time that I went to that bus terminal after, I looked in that spot where he used to stand, and he wasn't there. And it just seemed so unfair. But I love those bus drivers because he had a uniform that they had especially made for him with a little hat, just like theirs with the badge and all. And I remember thinking, what wonderful guys these are. I always liked bus drivers after that. <laughs> the next person that I, I, I found, my mother, when I was 11, a neighbor, some, some people moving into our neighborhood, they had eight children, and their oldest name was, was Carol. And Carol had, um, she was mentally challenged. In those days, we called it something else, and I don't even want to repeat it, but I think she had a lot of physical stuff going on with her. And we had a little beach at the end of our street in Salem. We lived on a cove. And my mom met Carol at the beach, and of course, they became instant friends. Often when I come home from school, there would be Carol sitting at the table having tea or milk and cookies, whatever my mother had baked that day. And I'd come in, and you know, she'd be talking to my mother, and we, I babysat for she and her brothers and sisters. And I cared a great deal about her and her well-being. One afternoon, I came home. I was in high school by this point, and I came in, and I went to the back door for some reason, and there she was huddled up on the stairs. And she had blood running down her legs. And she was in a, a doubled over position. At first, I thought she was injured. And then it dawned on me she was having her first period. So I brought her in the house, called to my mother, who was upstairs, hadn't heard her at the back door. Which my mother came down. She said, oh, Carol, you're growing up. You're getting to be a big girl. Cheryl and I have this happen every month, too. Come on upstairs. She brought her upstairs, bathed her, put some clothes on her. And I helped her put a sanitary napkin. Most of you have never heard of those things. I mean, with the little belt and the... <laughs> I hated them. The metal piece was always sticking in right here. We got her prepared and we brought... And my mom called her mother and said, Carol's over here and this is what's happening. She said, oh, thank God she's at your house. Because she knew my mother. So when, years later, I was up in New Hampshire where my parents had moved to retire on the Mount Washington Valley. Beautiful area. And my mom and I were talking. And I said to her, you know, Mom, I want you to know something. I want to tell you how important what you taught me, how much your comfort with everybody has helped me. And she said, what? And I told her about Mark, because I had seen him by then. And she said to me, would you please tell your father that, because he thinks you ran off to California because of me. I said, yeah, well, I didn't say it. Yeah, I did, but you know, now we have a chance to really get to know each other, because I've had all these miles between us. Meanwhile, my mother, she changed from that point on. Her whole attitude about my profession, my life's work, had changed for the better. Now, I want you to think about something. You know, when you think about people with disabilities, um, most of us don't think of them as sexual beings. And we, if you look back and, at yourself and think about, okay, what, what, what if you had a challenge, a physical challenge that was either caused by a birth, uh, injury or something that happens, an acquired injury, would you want your sexuality addressed? Well, that's the case for all people. It's so important for everybody to have that addressed. So that's another reason why I work with the disabled community. I meet the most wonderful people. The second person I want to quickly tell you about is a young man whose parents brought him to me from Minnesota. He was 23, he had cerebral palsy, and he couldn't talk or walk. But his parents had discovered that he knew how to count because his brothers and sister were playing games with him one day and said, Jim, stick out your tongue. Mm, so he did. And then they said, OK, Jim, stick out your tongue 100 times. And he stuck his tongue out 100 times. They had no idea he knew how to count. And so they started devising a communication system where he learned how to actually, you know, with the alphabet. He wrote a book, by the way, called The Hot's Alphabet which is being given to all, a lot of parents in Minnesota um, who have children with uh, cerebral palsy. So they can start thinking, maybe there's more I could do with my child and find ways to communicate better. Well, Jim learned how to communicate really well. And he let his parents know he wanted to find out about his sexuality. So they came, the whole family. I opened the door, mother, father, sister. You know, I'm standing there and I'm thinking, oh my God. The father and the sister went out 
And the mother stayed with me. And I'm thinking, oh my God, she's going to be here while I'm in there with him. <laughs> then I thought, good, she's here. <laughs> if anything happens, I've got his mother. I made her tea. I said, here are all my sex books. Read them. Enjoy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she did. And oh, it was such comfort. She actually showed me how to communicate with him before we went in the bedroom. She's the one that lifted him. She did a strong woman, lifted him, put him on the bed, undressed him. How beautiful is that? I mean, his mother was so concerned about how his life, she always wanted him to have the fullest life possible. And he did. He went skydiving, strapped to his father's back later on. Uh, several months, we had three sessions. They were wonderful. We explored. He wrote me a letter telling me how much he enjoyed oral sex. I, I was so happy. And, you know, <laughs> good. Um, she, wrote, she sent me an email about three months ago telling me that she had seen the sessions and she wanted to tell me that Jim had written the book, The Heart's Alphabet. And she said, you know, after he saw you, he had more confidence and was happier than he's ever been and it carried through until he died in 2009 which, oh, you know, I was very pleased that we had had. His mother and father are a role model for parents who want their children to have as much of a life as possible, no matter what's going on with them physically. Years ago, there wasn't a lot of information. Now there is. Google, sex and disability, you are going to find out so much. If you have friends who worry about their back injury or surgery or heart conditions, Google that, you'll get information. I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. The next time you see a disabled person, I'd love it if you would look at them and see they are more like you than you ever imagined. And lastly, I'd hopefully you will understand and feel the way I do. They deserve a seat at that table. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>